and welcome to The Last Looks Podcast, a show where we catch up with talented hairstylists and makeup artists in the film and television industry. We'll pick their super creative brains and find out all the good stuff. Join me, your host, Jamie Lee, in finding out what's what in the hair and makeup departments around the world. And now, a word from our sponsor. Welcome back to the podcast, Sammy. Thanks for having me again. So last time we had a chat about treating yourself with Haas Care Masks, what are we chatting about today? Well, since we covered the treatment portion of hair, I thought it'd be cool to give you some inside scoop as to what a lot of our pro stylists have been using behind the scenes to add volume and fullness to their actor's hair. Okay, Sammy, I'm waiting. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's our Biotin Boost Thickening Collection. And no joke, this is the best full range that'll thicken fine strands. So styling products can definitely go a long way, but you might want to kick off your thickening routine in the shower first. And we like to say, fun fact, a lot of our pro stylists send their actors home with the Biotin shampoo and conditioner for a fuller, plumper mane with every wash. I'll have to make sure to try that out. Biotin is a star ingredient when it comes to adding fullness to hair. Yeah, I mean, we're big fans of biotin infused products and we've actually formulated this collection with a blend of collagen and coffee on top of the biotin, which is where you're actually getting that added boost from. The ingredients end up working over time to volumize and fortify no matter which product you use from the line, whether it's the shampoo conditioner, the leave-in spray, or the dry shampoo. Now, I'm definitely a dry shampoo addict, so can you tell me about Hask's dry shampoo? Um, of course. <laughs> it's great for touch-ups and instant pick-me-ups when trying to add a little life back into your hair. This is both on set and off, so it's great. Whether you want to rid your scalp of oil, give it a bit of a dry style, this biotin shampoo will really do it. Plus, it's aluminum-free, so you can feel super safe while using it. Thanks, Sammy, to you and Hask for joining us on the Last Looks podcast. Thanks for having me. And again, if anyone in the TV and film styling community ever needs any help with supporting projects that they're working on, send us an email at hask at stonemanagement.net, and we'd be happy to help with whatever you need. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Had a blast. And now, our feature presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our bonus 2021 Makeup and Hair Oscars special. We have five of these beauties lined up for you to absorb and enjoy. I'm so incredibly grateful to all the guests on these bonus episodes as I understand how precious everyone's time is. When they're working full time on a project and being bombarded with interviews, it can all get a little overwhelming, I'm sure. So, for that, thank you, thank you, and thank you. For each of the five bonus episodes, the nominees were all asked the same questions. So if I sound like a broken record, that's because I am. But as you'll hear, their answers are all very different. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast team. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Hello. And may I just say a huge congratulations on your Oscar nomination for your work on the film Pinocchio. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Now let's start with introductions. If you guys could each tell me your name and what your position on the team was, that would be an awesome start. Okay. I'm Francesco Pegoretti. I am the hair designer of the movie, the film Pinocchio. I'm Dalia Colli, the makeup designer of Pinocchio, uh, at the side of Mark Coulier. And I'm Mark Coulier, the prosthetics designer on Pinocchio. Brilliant. So what I would like to know first is when you heard the news that you had been nominated and got into the final five, what was the first thought that came to mind? So I had many thoughts initially, combined with the overwhelming emotion, sure, I thought of my family and my mother's reaction and of myself and my life. And I said to myself, but I'm really nominated for an Oscar. So anyway, absolutely immense happiness, but also uh, a feeling of responsibility towards the film. Amazing. And Dahlia? I heard the news of nomination from a friend while I was driving on the highway, traveling to Rome from work, and my legs started shaking and Decided to stop the car <laughs> to catch my, my breath. My eyes filled with tears and I started to laugh a lot with my friend. 
and uh, I felt a, a big, big emotion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I made a video call with with my family at the same time. And I thought, well, now everything can happen. <laughs> a big emotion, really big. Maybe too big for me. <laughs> While driving, anyway, that sounds yeah. dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very. Yeah. That's amazing. And what about you, Mark? Yeah, just uh, really excited. You know, I've been to the awards ceremonies before, so I know how how great it is. And you know, just a little bit of you know thinking about like this time, a bit of worry about how how it was all going to happen and whether we'd be able to get over there or not, which we're still trying to sort out at the moment. But really mm-hmm. super excited for all the crew as well. You know, they're all really you know worked hard on this, and it's it's great to get there. You know, and get that nomination. You know, I know how difficult it is to actually get into the final nominations so yeah really 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 happy that's awesome i love it hey now i don't know who wants to answer this question or if you all do at what point did you decide that you would submit your work to the academy to be considered what kind of helps you make that decision to be like okay we're going to submit our work and see what happens as i'm a member of the academy that i'm in the meetings that they have you know as soon as you become a member you're you're then on the discussion board at the at the oscars at the academy group there's a, a discussion board where you post everyone posts on films they recommend that have makeup that's interesting and varied and you know then it's uh, just a case of thinking well do we think there's enough work in pinocchio to uh, to enable us to submit it you know but anybody can submit for a film that's eligible and you just send a portfolio in of your work and and then it's considered by the makeup and uh, and hairstylist branch and obviously you felt that you had enough work that was amazing to be submitted for pinocchio so yeah that makes total sense yeah, I think, you know, I think with Francesco's work and Dahlia's work and the prosthetics as well, you know, we've got we've got a lot of different styles and techniques and characters and prosthetics mm. and there's a bit of everything in there, you know, so really it's a wealth of, of makeup technique and, you know, I think that helps as well with, you know, being considered for uh, inclusion, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So Dahlia and Francesco, did you kind of have a moment of, I don't know, just excitement at that point? Because had you submitted your work before to the Academy? I think there are many factors to consider. I think a strong teamwork between hair, uh, makeup uh, and prosthetics. So that transform the actors into various characters and um, paying attention to every single detail, you know, making each of, each of them credible and magical. Also, a great craftsmanship that limits the need for visual effects too. Yeah, perfect. What about you, Dahlia? I think that when Pinocchio was released in Italian theatres, December 25, 2020, I took all my nine-years-old daughter's classmates, including the teachers, to see the premiere (laughs) in our city. To my great, great joy, all the children, even the most restless, were kidnapped by the film by the images, dark and wonderful at the same time. At the exit, they overwhelmed me with questions. The most attentive asked me if Pinocchio was digital or how did the snails move or if Cat and Fox really had nails like this. Very happy with their reaction because Pinocchio's story is now outdated at uh, at that age. And, And despite this, they were glued to the big screen. And you could see their little hands in the back light of the room uh, uh, indicated the characters that populate the story. And I was happy with the re- this reaction because children, especially in the age group of 10 years and over, are all mm. used to the best digital effect and surprise them is not easy. I think we yeah. managed it just a bit, <laughs> I hope. No, that's amazing. What a lovely treat for the class. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, with the teacher. So, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Now, I would love you guys to talk me through, I know you have a lot of characters, but I just want you to talk me through two characters from the film. So makeup and hair-wise, just everything from research and development through to daily application. I would like to talk about the characters uh, of Geppetto, played by, you know, Roberto Benigni. You know, turning, turning Benigni into a Geppetto was not, not easy. And I used it for him two different weeks to tell the character's age difference. 
and this week's one short and, and quicker, uh, and the other longer and uh, sparser. With Dahlia, together, we decide to first uh, apply a cap, a cap to recreate the skin. On, on the skin on which to apply the wig. The director also asked me for a line that recalled the head of a poor clown. And his head also told um, of his poverty. So also the, I created the texture, I recreated the texture head like as natural as possible to, to feel, to, to see this poverty, this his poverty. Uh, it's a natural style. And secondly, I can talk about the, the, the blue fairy, mm-hmm. or, rad, or rather the two blue fairies, because in the film, as in the book, there are two, one child and the other adult. For the weeks, uh, I worked with the studios in Rome to create these two weeks of the same color, one for, for each of, of the fairies. So the first challenge for me was just uh, to create the, um, the, the color, this color. Uh, Matteo, the director, wanted a very light color for her, almost white, uh, but uh, with a very light blue tone. So, you know, after several tests, uh, I managed to get the, the, the right result for her. And for the young fairy, I was inspired by, by photo, the photos of the period, even also the, you know, the post-mortem ones, because the idea for the young fairy was she wear a, a little ghost. Mm. I also, for her, I, I created the flower crown she wears using some vintage uh, fabric flowers that I find uh, in some old vintage store. And once finished, before also going to the set, I sprinkled uh, some ash on the hair to create uh, a dusty and antique patina. And for the other fairy, I was inspired by the dread of the, the first edition of Pinocchio. And I used uh, the same hair color as the, the young fairy, but very long. I, I did very long hair with a, you know, some softer, sweet. Can I say, almost ethereal style for her, you know, like mm-hmm. some magical character. Beautiful. It was so difficult to find this color, unbelievable, because he, does, he didn't mm, want something uh, classic color for her, because everybody knows the, this character in Italy, is mm-hmm. very famous, no? It's not simple to find uh, something new, a new idea for her. It was a good challenge for me. <laughs> Yeah, you had to create yeah. it. Yeah. Amazing. Who would like to go next? Obviously, we had the character of uh, Pinocchio to do. It was incredibly difficult to get from A to B, in, or, well, A to Z, actually, in, into achieving the finished design. You know, We started off with a different performer to Federico initially, and we did all our designs, and Matteo loved what we were doing. We based everything on, I think it was a drawing by Chiostri, actually. We were looking at the original drawings of Mazzanti and Chiostri, and just trying to get that flavor of those illustrations that Francesco was just talking about in those early editions of the book. And Pinocchio has this kind of long pointy nose that heads in a downward direction and, and, and actually looks a bit older than you imagine Pinocchio to be. He kind of looks sort of early teens even in some of the drawings that you look at. We were getting a, a long, a fair way into the approval process with that, with Matteo. He was loving the sculptures that we were doing. Oh. had uh, Sebastian Lockman, a sculptor, a really great sculptor working for me, who just concentrated on Pinocchio for about six months, actually. And then it was decided that Federico Ayalapi was going to play the character, and he's got a totally different facial structure. Wow. Now, you can design as much as you like on paper and in drawings and everything else, but you'll always redesign it once you get your performer because our prosthetics have to fit his face they have to move with the skin they have to use the eye proportions that we were going to have real eyes you know the actor's eyes showing through so we completely then had to redesign it all on Federico. So we had a little computer scan of his head and we 3D printed that and we started our, our real journey towards getting the, what appears finally on screen, you know, which was a case of Matteo Garoni had a great concept designer, Pietro Di Scolo Mambro, who was working for him. And he'd done these beautiful drawings of all the characters, you know, give, giving us a starting point for everything. Mm. And he'd done, so basically we worked back and forth with Matteo and Pietro and myself and Sebastian and we'd sculpt 
a, a certain look. We'd take photographs of it. We'd scan it. We'd send it over. Pietro would then do some adjustments with Matteo because he's, you know, over in Italy with him. If we'd had a studio in Italy, we'd have been able to sit down the three of us together. But we did it. We did it back and forth by email. And we just basically honed the design over months back and forth doing little adjustments. And alongside that, you know, that's just getting the shape and the pitch of the nose and the angle and the size and the cuteness and the finish. Mm. And we also had to get the the wood grain texture, you know, and make sure that that looked, I really wanted it to look like real wood. You know, I wanted you to think that you could, you know, tap it on the head when he's wearing it and it sound mm. like wood. So we, we went to great pains to make all that wood grain look as real as possible. And then, you know, the third aspect of it was to get the right color. It's very difficult to paint wood and make it look like real wood. It's very easy to paint wood and make it look like fake wood. You know, you can paint mm. a wood grain quite easily on something and make it look like fake wood, you know, but we really wanted it to look like real wood. So, and that was very difficult. You know, there's a lot of highlight and shadow and reflection in, in a wood grain. When you look at a wood grain really close up, there's lots of detail and line and, and variation in color. And we, I had a painter, Anna Kiso, who was designing the paint job for that. And she just did a really beautiful job of recreating wood. Matteo Garoni at one point sent us a piece of wood. I said to him, you know, what, what color do you want this wood? You know, there's so many different variations. And, mm. you know, Matteo actually sent us a piece of wood. So we used that as reference to get our look, you know, and to the point where we could hold the piece of wood next to our silicone on pieces and it looked the same and that that's when you know you're getting close to achieving what you need to achieve you know yeah that's awesome tell me um do you know what kind of wood it was i think it was oak uh, that we okay. used in the end in the story he's uh, made out of cherry wood but uh, we looked at the cherry wood and it was slightly pinker and uh, a bit darker and mateo wanted it, him to be paler and you know so we went with the oak in the end i think that's awesome. Yes, I guess I have to say every single makeup on this show was prosthetic makeup, was complex, you know. There wasn't a simple makeup out of all of them. The puppet mm. theater, you know, the the tuna fish, the gorilla judge, they were all had their own set of problems. I guess the snail was the most complex mm. one, but I've spoken about that quite a lot. So I think the birds, the raven and the owl, the two doctors that come in, you know, we really wanted those guys, we really wanted the feathers to look beautiful and to bring some character into them. So we punched like little tiny, we went from hair to fur to small feathers to larger feathers. You know, I didn't want to have the whole thing with the face covered in feathers because you mm. lose a lot of expression and Matteo is very character driven you know and he wants to see expression through the prosthetics you know he doesn't want the prosthetics to inhibit the performers so you know we spent a month working out the feathers cutting and shaping each feather that went onto the raven and the owl and trying to make the two characters you know work as a little double act you know so they're totally different in structure you know the raven is long and pointy as a longer beak uh, mm. and he's dark and we wanted to get a lot of variation in color th into the raven so that he's not just black yeah. so we had a lot of blues and pinks to the to the grays and and then the owl uh, as well we wanted him to have that sort of almost like a barn owl look you know or a tawny owl where the face is a bit flatter and the beak is smaller and just so that he looked like the foil to the raven you know the, if you imagine them as a sort of comedy double act when they come on yeah. And then, you know, we wanted to keep the human mouth. So we just had a mm. top beak and we kept the human mouth, which uh, we weren't sure was going to work, but we we did a, a few concepts. Uh, Sebastian Lochman again sculpted uh, a concept and had uh, an Italian sculptor, Andrea Usebi, who's really fantastic too. He came over from Italy, he's worked with me before, and uh, he sculpted the owl from a, a design done by Sebastian. Uh, and these in turn were done from concepts done by Pietro again. And then we just worked it out. You know, we, we thought actually, yeah, we can do it without the bottom beak. So because it come, becomes a little bit more anthropomorphic, you know, less less comedy with the top of top beak and bottom beak and nobody really nobody nobody really picks up on that but it's a small detail but it did make quite a bit of difference to the characters I'm sure it made a huge difference for the actors as well to be able to yeah they can talk they could talk and they could deliver mm. their lines and they're not talking through this beak you know it's like it, it's almost like you know they said once the prosthetics were on that it didn't really get in the way you know it was it was good it allowed them to perform yeah that's awesome Dahlia yeah for fairies Matteo Garrone asked me a sort of a par little paradox. Represent death in all its beauty. 
because in the story, the fairy is a ghost. I remember the, the original book. In the original book, there are a lot of draw, ink drawings. And the fairy was very scared. But we, we need that this ghost, this fairy, be ethereal, maternal, but also disturbing and mysterious. I, I wanted her to embody uh, sensuality of uh, uh, pre raphaelitas woman, for example. Her skin had to be dramatic, like the woman uh, of Clint, uh, can- uh, Clint Cambances. Because I try my inspiration from the the history, the heart of history, and uh, thanks thanks to beautiful Alida and Marine, the two the two actresses who played the young and the adult fairy, uh, I used a cold color palette based on the shades of Prussian blue for shadows and uh, porcelain, ivory, and eyes white for light zone. They were very. Uh, lunar, okay, with with the light of the the, the moon on the face. Uh, after her natural high brow and lashes became as the, as the color of hair of the wig, uh, this color no color, trying to achieve a, um, a result uh, between beauty and gloomy, just a bit, yeah. And uh, with the with the high brush technique, I can import. Uh, a sort of a, a scientific technique, like a pontilism. And, and uh, I think that the, the HD resolution, uh, which in simple terms uh, divided images in pixels, works in the same way of the pontilism te- technique and has the human eye, uh, which perceives the union of all dots of color that compose the, the final one. So with this technique, I can create this light skin if I used three different colors to achieve this sort of white, okay? That it's not mm. white, but it's it's an iridescent color at the end, okay? And I, I put a, a film of and color or, uh, on all the skin and the shadow also on the nails because I wanted that uh, the fairy were this beautiful ghost, but uh, so naturally, so earthly at the same time. Yeah, beautiful. I have to say, I'm just going to I'm just going to butt in there and just say that, you know, those makeups were so beautiful on set. You know, when Alida and Maureen were on set, it, the hair and the makeup was, I have to say, it was just so beautiful. And you couldn't not stare at them. You know, it's just mm. Alida looked amazing. She looked she looked so great. Thank you. Mark. It's not often I go on set and I'm looking at a makeup. And I'm just thinking, wow, that is phenomenal. It looks so good. <laughs> well, and. I won't explain also the two characters of Cat and Fox because I enjoyed myself a lot to do this because I work on, on uh, with Mark because the two characters at the beginning of the makeup passed on the end of Stephen. He applied a little animal muzzle and animal hair. And after this application, mm. I continued the, the makeup with the application of fake bird, tuft by tuft, and I lent, lent, lent in the, the high brow and the high line of the of the hair of the actor and, and this this fake bird that was blending in different colors and quality because for cat i use it the gray gray white and, and black and for fox mm. red brown and all colors of of the of the hurt of the wood the two characters uh, uh, were very interesting for me because uh, they were a, a mix a, a really mix of uh, special makeup so to different uh, school, okay. I remember that one time, uh, one time when I, I applied this prosthesis, and I was so excited because it was a bigger responsibility. But they were so perfect that I didn't have any problem. For both characters, I realized it the animalistic nails, and they were modeled on the uh, on the cast of the actor's hands, uh, reproduces the uh, reproduced in series and in resin. And I keep the rest of these like a treasure in a box in my laboratory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we used uh, we used real cat hairs on the cat as well. Yeah. We said cat whiskers. Yeah, we used real cat whiskers because uh, a friend of mine who, who does hair work, Lisa Carasido, she was collecting the whiskers of her, <laughs> her cat for ages. So we brought them over and we put them into the prosthetic and, and we used them on, on the character. That's amazing. So no cats were harmed in the making of the exactly. makeup. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are fun characters to watch. I thoroughly enjoyed those two. Brilliant. What I would love to know is what did you guys find to be your biggest challenge during filming? Mark, should we start with you? Oh, yes. I mean, the biggest challenge really, I mean, there were so many challenges. You know, it's a smallish production. We didn't have all the facilities that you have on these, you know, big productions. And yet 
big ideas makeup wise you know lots mm. of characters on lots of prosthetics so just juggling all that around you know we did the makeup on federico about 50 times and we had to it's a new set of pieces for anybody mm. who doesn't know that already it's a new set of pieces every single day because the edges get destroyed so we're there painting you know susie redfern Stephen murphy anna keeser they're sticking the makeup on and then painting the next sets of pieces each day whilst I had Robin Pritchard and Brogan Sharp go on set with looking after Federica on set and whilst I was organizing everything else all the other characters the prosthetic characters so the difficulty of of doing that on an eight-year-old boy you know is it's hard if anyone's ever done a 20 minute you know face painting on an eight-year-old boy who's restless Mm -hmm. and you know needs entertaining you know we had to be part school teacher part entertainer and part makeup artist when we were sticking the makeup on that was really tough that that i can't tell you how tough that was to to just you know it's not like dealing with an adult actor you know you have to take the child into consideration you know he'd have to stop for a break and he'd be running around and you know that was quite tough that that and the combination of the amount of sets of pieces that we had to do and then you know Matteo right at the last minute the the legs were going to be digital at one point and right at the last minute Matteo said oh no I want them to be in camera so we we very quickly in the last couple of weeks before we came out to Italy sculpted a, a pair of trousers you know a silicon wooden legs mm. and we had to fit wooden sculpture over some little sports shoes so that Federico would be comfortable so just dealing with those and having Federico you know running around in mud outside and in you know we had to clean those off every night and it you know just looking after that one character you know we did about 35 different makeups but just looking after Pinocchio I can't tell you how many how many molds we did you know we did four different stages of the makeup as well as he gets chipped and scratched as he goes through the film so we we not only did the full set of molds for the first stage we had duplications of all the pieces to do for each stage of makeup you know at one point we were shipping pieces out and i had people coming back and forth so i did have the ability to for some people to bring things out with them but there was one point when we we were like okay we have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday's set of pieces, but Thursday we don't have a set of pieces. And then on Friday we go to stage two so that we had pieces for that. We had to fly somebody over from the UK just to bring one set of pieces over to cover a day. You know, I had a girl working for me, Leah Hamill, and she she'd actually brought one set of pieces. It was really down to the wire, you know. Matteo had changed the design about three or four weeks before we started filming. So we we really had to remake everything from scratch about four weeks out and we we spent the rest of the time chasing trying to catch up so that that was the hardest bit yeah and nerve-wracking yes what about you dahlia we had been talking about the pinocchio's project two years before meet mark coolier and start to shoot i should have created the looks of all those characters who did not require uh, the intervention of Mark's staff, expect for Captain Fox. And to create the characters, I, I wanted to remember the sensation and feelings I experienced when, when I read the book of Pinocchio as a child, precisely because Matteo asked us uh, real uh, characters. And I thought, who better than a child can give life to a stylized and terrifying ink drawing uh, like those in the original book. And I wanted to transform those sensations into a makeup project that, that could bring together the earthly and magical reality. It often happens to me that the most difficult part of my job is the moment of the creation. When you find yourself mm. uh, in front of a, a sort of a, a white paper, and uh, you have to materialize uh, an idea. But um, every character has important makeup intervention. For Geppetto, for example, Geppetto uh, has two phases of, of makeup. At the beginning of the story, he's an angry and lonely carpenter with uh, an unkempt bird, uh, a face blackened from the poverty. His hands are injured from the cold and work. And, but his look mm. changes when he gets trapped in the belly of the fish. And his makeup is on the, the green tone now. I thought as a, as a child about the fact that I lived in a place without sun and uh, in the depth mm. of the sea. I thought about the microorganism of the sea and the animal's belly. And he became an integral part of the belly, I thought. Like, like when I read the book. Because if a man 
can survive into the belly of a fish, maybe become mm. like the, like the fish. I remember I won't I won't say this because I'm so happy to meet and work with Roberto Benigni. Uh, never forget when he uses to joke with me during the long and difficult preparation, asking, uh, I don't know, the capital of Kazakhstan or some guesses game to pass time, uh, which always uh, I didn't know. So <laughs> during this time, yeah. So Morocco for me is a big challenge from the beginning to the end, really. Yeah, that's amazing. Francesca? Well, I think the biggest challenge uh, was for me was to maintain the right balance in the construction of uh, the characters because to maintain the right balance between me, the makeup and the prosthetics with Mark, but also with the costume with the her department because each frame like a painting you know so to maintain uh, this balance the big challenge was to be uh, careful that everything was aligned with the director's project and uh, because uh, for him everything uh, has to be absolutely authentic and original so for me this one was very very big a uh, big challenge to mm. to stay in the big bal in, in this balance in this uh, big balance with all departments because also we I remember we worked really with the harmony with each designer which the person was an amazing experience but every day I was so careful that everything was very uh, in the in the concept uh, still in the concept still in the in the mood of the movie you know yeah That makes total sense. When you have such a large project and so many people involved, it's really important yeah. to keep it keep that harmony and keep it cohesive so it's not everyone's going in completely different directions. So it's good to stay conscious of that. I was wondering if there were any standout lessons that you learned from this project. In great and harmony and collaboration you can have a great results. This uh, mm. this is a big lesson. So all together working together with with harmony with passions the, the union with all departments uh, or, uh, with everybody you you can you can have a, a great uh, a great results yeah perfect what about you mark any lessons learned never work with children or animals <laughs> <laughs> no i'm joking the old adage i think you know i think francesca has sort of hit the nail on the head that my my main thing is i've worked on some big movies over the last few years and some small films you know I've done little films that are are passion oriented and and the thing that i learn most about working on a film like this is that my interest is working with passionate people who who really care about filmmaking and there's a level of communication you get on a film like this with someone like mateo that you don't get on the big movies that have a big you know infrastructure that have studios involvement and it's very difficult to have a dialogue with the director so the main thing i learned from this is that this is exactly the kind of film that i like to work on you know it's challenging the work is interesting the people are enthusiastic and great to work with and talented and this is a, a project that mateo storyboarded when he was like 12 years old so he wanted to make this since he was a, since he was a kid you know it's amazing and just listening to the way everybody talks about it you know that how close they are to it you know and how much we all cared about it you know how much we wanted to make these characters look really beautiful you know and that that's kind of what i took away from this project really do do more films like this you know <laughs> yeah awesome dalia i think that when you have the great opportunity to work with the professionals of caliber of mark cooler and his entire staff and francesco pegoretti it is practically impossible not to learn new things and uh, if you put the genius and sincerity of the language of our director matteo garrone at the head of the group you can expect the impossible to become possible in fact i think that cgi was only used for the scene of the underwater transformation of the donkey a scene where the wooden nose grows to become a branch and thanks to this version of pinocchio it is experiencing a slight demotion toward to the artisan of the 90s like the digital one the techniques of special makeup and and makeup have evolved a lot uh, thanks also the use of extremely versatile uh, materials 
well, um, created uh, by this international team. Uh, so precisely this type of result, I think, a usable uh, aesthetic and appreciated by everyone, uh, even by those ruthless teenagers now accustomed to the virtual reality. And here's what I learned on this adventure, that the impossible can be possible. And the mere f- I'm here talking with you is a, is a proof of that, I think. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So I would love to know, this, this can be a difficult question, I think, sometimes times but um, what do you feel sets your work apart from your fellow nominees uh, i know for sure uh, what we have in common creativity uh, love for our work which let us uh, all of us uh, to stay f- far from our family our country uh, to fight against fatigue uh, bad weather long nights maybe to shoot on the cold uh, waiting to intervene immediately on the actors. I think passion guides our hearts. And so I want to say congratulations to, to Paul and good luck. Yeah, same thing, really. You know, it is difficult. There's a lot of competition out there. It is difficult to get into the final five films that are, are, are nominated. And, you know, I think just listening to everybody talk about their various projects over the last couple of weeks it's amazing you know to hear the struggles that everybody goes through to get a particular color of hair or a particular texture in a wig or a particular look on somebody's face with makeup we're all like Dahlia said you know we're all very very passionate about what we do you know otherwise we wouldn't be doing this because it is such a tough job that mm. actually unless you love it you would not do it you know and yeah. and that really comes through with everybody's work really so yeah good luck to good luck to everybody really there's a lot of talented people out there who've achieved some really great work this year yeah so well the main difference is in the genre of the film maybe because in Pinocchio, you know, there are many different components present, because but also fantasy, where so many different characters, you know, human, homomorphic animals, uh, animated wooden puppets. So everything also in a in an imaginary world, and I think this is the complexity and the vastness of these characters. They make the difference. Uh, maybe I think which with this difference, which uh, consequently allowed allowed me uh, to express myself on several fronts. You know, uh, I think this is for me is the the difference. Well put, everybody. It's never a, an easy question to answer. I think, but you did well. I wanted to give you guys the opportunity because I know you don't always get to kind of just give a shout out and a thank you to all those people that kind of helped you on the project. So I just wanted to give you a moment to, if you wanted to say a thanks to people on the team. In a big project as Garrone's Pinocchio, you have to consider the importance of details. In fact, around our protagonists, there were a world populated by people from uh, 19th century whose appearance spoke about life spent on the fatigue, uh, when have a shower was not so simple to have. The town where Pinocchio born is composed by artisans, breeders, treaders, and teachers. And uh, these characters needed the makeup department in their intervention every day. To take care of them, there were a beautiful team of girls, which passion and dedication had cured the extras. And uh, a special thanks goes to Valentina Tomljanovic, who helped me to realize Cat and Fox and guided the, the organization of access. Thank you, girls. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I want to say thank you to my amazing team, to Marta Jacoponi, that she worked with me and she was amazing. She helped me a lot in, during the, the shooting. Thank you to the studio, Rocchetti Rocchetti Studios, that where I created the, the weeks. For the, for the movie. Thank you to Mark because it was a very wonderful experience to work with him and he is an amazing team. Also, thanks. I want to say thank you to Matteo Garrone to, to get me this, uh, this opportunity to work mm. in this project. Awesome. Well said. Uh, I mean, I've got like 50, 52 crew members. <laughs> I don't want to be with a massive list of names, so I'm just going to shout out quite a few that were really important mm-hmm. to this. Right. Sebastian, Sebastian Lockman, the guy who sculpted a lot of the early designs and w- worked so hard on Pinocchio. Then my makeup team out there were Robin Pritchard, Anna Kieser, Stephen Murphy, 
Susie Redfern, Brogan Sharp were all with me, sticking the megaphone, those, those five. And then really a huge shout out to the mold makers. You know, I had Tom Packwood, Colin Mangan, Adam Edwards, my main silicon person who's just toils away in the background and never gets any credit for anything. Kate Woodhead, Julian Jarvis, Dave Felstead, Reza Cream, who did the foam. I've got hair people who just did the most beautiful work. Faye Windridge, Vicky Stockwell, Sheralta Vague. Lisa Caracido, Bethan Hollington. It just goes on and on. And and to the Italian friends who came over and helped with the application of the puppet theatre and other things, uh, like Lorenzo Tamburi and Michel Vaccaro, Valentina Vizintin, Francesca Galafas. It was great to have some of the Italian guys come over. And a really big shout out to Pietro Di Scola, actually, who, you know, his designs were so beautiful. It's really great to get some concept designs that actually point you in the right direction, you know, and because he's Italian and working directly with Matteo, it was really crucial input for us to get the tone of everything right, you know, to get the mm. fantasy quality right and pitch it right where those Chiostri and Mazzanti drawings are, because there's so many different ways you could go with it. And we didn't want it to be cartoony you know it had to be anthropomorphic and full of character and his drawings were so beautiful that actually you know it was really great to have him just get that initial sometimes you just need that initial flavor of what the director wants and then you can expand mm. and then we can elaborate and we did you know we did a lot of elaboration and but we worked so closely together with with everybody that it, it was really great you know the costume designs were so beautiful you know Massimo did a, such a great job production designer and, and the light cinematographer Nick Bruel Nick Bruel was just incredible made everything they, they both made everything look like a photograph you know it was it was it was really amazing and of course thank you to Francesca and Dahlia for uh, their beautiful work oh that's awesome okay guys it has been so insightful to learn more about what it took to get your work on camera daily and in turn bring you to this point today being nominated for an Oscar so again congratulations back to you and thanks for joining me thank you thank you our pleasure for links to see more about our guests go to our Instagram at the last looks podcast or our website the if you want to keep up with new episodes being released be sure to subscribe through Apple podcasts Spotify Amazon Google Play YouTube or any podcast streaming platform. And remember, if you're enjoying the show, share it. The Last Looks podcast would like to thank Brett Stanley and Sabrina Castro. The song Fun Time by DJ Quads. Thanks for listening. Until next time. That's a wrap, people.